there's something to be said for what Chris Kleiman has built, that Kansas State is entering their third season in a row with Big 12 title aspirations. There was no like off year in between. 22, uh, maybe you know they were picked fifth in the league, but I think all of us had a feeling that that was a team that could contend for a Big 12 championship. We certainly felt that way last year, and I think we feel that way again this year. Thanks for listening to KC Sports Network, proudly presented by Emprise Bank. If you're thinking about starting a business or know someone who is, check out Emprise Bank's SBA Loans. It's always good to know your options, and they can be your partner in possible. Hello and welcome into another 2024 football season, another football season anyway, and it is the Three Ma Podcast. John Kurtz, Derek Young, Cole Manbeck all with you as we give you our Week one preview, K-State and UT Martin kick it off on Saturday at Bill Snyder Family Stadium. So you've been hearing the warnings for a long time. You are now officially down to days, days left to get out to uh, your favorite local liquor store and find some Ben Holiday bottled in Bond bourbon from our friends at Holiday Distillery. You need it for the tailgate this weekend or the watch party, wherever it is that you're going to be watching this game. Get Ben Holiday bottled and bond bourbon. Get 360 vodka, not just for yourselves, but for the sake of everybody else who is going to be watching with you that will not be disappointed. And at the same time, you'll be supporting a great business of K-State folks who really enjoy the pod, really enjoy the cats, and uh, definitely will be watching on Saturday as well. So thank you to our friends at Holiday Distillery, as always. And for those of you who are loyal listeners of the podcast, we have uh, an opportunity for you here before we get rolling to make a little extra cash that you can then use to uh, perhaps buy some Ben Holiday bottled and bond bourbon. Uh, if you'd like an extra 500 bucks and get a $500 gift card, you can go to bluewirepods.com slash survey and complete the Blue Wire audience survey about you and your podcast listing habits for a chance to win the aforementioned $500 gift card. This survey will help create a better advertising experience for audiences and in turn help this show. It's bluewirepods.com slash survey where all you have to do is answer simple questions for a chance to win 500 bucks. Make sure to read full terms and disclaimer plus complete the survey for a chance to win. Bluewirepods.com slash survey. The link is also in the show notes of this episode. All right, we are back into mid-season form, I'm sure, here in week one as K-State gets ready for UT Martin, FCS opponent, to uh, kick off the season. And things will get rolling pretty quickly here with a road trip to Tulane and then a Friday night game against Arizona. But as we veer into the headlines here, guys, we're on the precipice of a second straight season with really high expectations for a second consecutive year. K-State picks second in the Big 12 while receiving a handful of first-place votes. Um, the college football playoff feels legitimately within reach this year, which is different because it's the expanded playoff. You just need to win the conference championship to get in. So because of that, it almost feels a little bit different even than last year did, where it's a, it's a different kind of national opportunity that's out in front of this team this year. I would agree. Uh, it seems like for a lot of college football teams, right, like that they're actually playing for something a little extra this year even if the end result is probably going to look quite similar i would imagine but you you still feel like you're in this invitational of sorts that is college football and you're not in a silo just you know flailing your arms for no reason so you know a lot of folks have called it a transformative college football season in many ways it is and fortunately for kansas state that's coinciding simultaneously with a team with a lot of high upside potential and an ability to for a Big 12 championship. So uh, it's good to have football back, and it'll be interesting to see how the season unfolds. Like you said, uh, despite it being, for the most part, a fortunate schedule for K-State, uh, they, they don't get eased into it too much beyond just the FCS game in Week 1. Yeah, I mean, look, K-State is loved in the advanced metrics. We've talked about it before on this show. We had Brian Fremo on last week, uh, one of the most respected college football advanced analytics metrics guys. And if you look through the projections, look, he has K-State at 10-2 and two this season. That's what his model projects K-State out at. They have a 66% chance to win 10 games or more and a 10% chance of going 12-0 and 0 on the season. Also, a 96.6% chance that they win eight or more games. So the goal is obviously 
to win 10 plus. His model loves K-State. Kelly Ford, SK State at a 61% chance to win nine or more games, a 48% chance to win 10 or more. So the models love Kansas State. The expectations are there for this football team, and we'll see if they can get over the hump. A lot of it's going to come down to how do they do in one score games. That was the glaring difference between last year and 2022 when they were the Big 12 champs. In 2022, they go three and two in one score games. Last year, they go one and four in one score games. Why is that important? Because if you look at K-State's quality of the game, so like if you take Kelly Ford's most watchable games, his watchability factor that he has as part of his metrics, which isn't based on the TV ratings, but rather the quality and competitiveness of a game based on his model. It's projected weighted score of projected quality and competitiveness. K-State has seven top 10 games out of 14 weekends in his watchability score. Five games in the top five in the country different weeks this season. That means that K-State is going to be involved in a lot of potential seven, 10-point type games. K-State's going to have to be better in one-score opportunities. You exclude the COVID season. Chris Kleiman is 8-11 and in one-score games. That's not a bad record. I mean, that's really in, in line. Kyle Whittingham's 28-26. and 26. It's not that far off. But K-State is going to have to find a way to close big games. I also went through guys real quick on the uh, the expectations of the past and looked at some of the Big 12 preseason polls because it feels like K-State fans get paranoid when there's high expectations put on their plate and on the shoulders of this program. They like to be more of the underdog. Obviously, K-State picked second last year. They finished in a three-way tie at fourth at six and three. But if you beat Iowa State last year, guys, in that snow game, which is another reason why it was so frustrating, you finish in a tie with Oklahoma State and Oklahoma at 7-2 and two for the second-best mark in the league. You look at 2022, K-State was picked 5th in the preseason Big 12 poll. TCU was 7th in the preseason poll. Obviously, those two teams play in the Big 12 championship, and uh, Kansas State comes out on top. Uh, you look at 2012, K-State was picked to finish 6th in the Big 12 preseason poll. OU was picked to win the league. West Virginia was number 2. K-State went 8-1. and one won the league. West Virginia went four and five, seven and six overall. You can go down the list, guys, of different years. And I think part of the the paranoia with K-State fans is like it feels like often when they have high expectations, when they're picked to win the conference or they're picked to win the division, when you go back to the North and South divisions of the old Big 12 back in 2001, even when they were ranked number 13 nationally and they finished six and sixth overall. Um, you look at 2002, Pick to finish third in the Big 12 North behind Colorado and Nebraska. And what do they do? They go 11 and 2, 6 and 2 in the league, and finish number six in the coaches' bowl. It does seem that K State has historically performed a little better when the expectations are lower, but you want the expectations to be high. That means you're doing the right things. And I think K State, I think this football team is ready to achieve and exceed the expectations set on their shoulders. What's well, a new era, too? I mean, there's no Texas or mainly Oklahoma to, to take up the top spot at the, the top of the poll, which w- would have been the case for a number of those years. And that's that's why this is new and another piece of the puzzle here, not just college football playoff, but the league is new and the top spot is really up for grabs. You know, I mean, I think most people look at Utah, Oklahoma State, K-State as potentially the, the three most certainly consistent programs in recent memory that would have the shot at taking over that top spot, becoming a new Oklahoma of sorts in the league. It'll it'll be tough to do, and it might not happen because there's a lot of parity that's going to be there. But that's another opportunity that's out in front of you this season is to establish yourself as the best program in the new league. Um, you know, I'll give a shout-out to Stan Weber. I, I listened to him talk last night at the KC Catpackers event, and he, he spoke at length about that factor. You know, that back in the day it was Nebraska, and you saw the N on the helmet, and you got intimidated, then it was Oklahoma – you felt like going into a lot of those games, teams did across the league, well, we're going to lose because this is Oklahoma. And there's no team like that right now in the Big 12. Somebody needs to establish themselves as that, and uh, this is this is your first opportunity to do so. And, I, and I'd imagine um, that team going forward, if I was to muster a pretty good guess, is, is and maybe it's all three of them, but one or two or all three of Kansas State, Oklahoma State, and Utah. And look, it worked out in 22, but not in 23. But some, there's something to be said for what Chris Kleiman has built, that Kansas State is entering their third season in a row with Big 12 title aspirations. There was no like off year in between. 22, uh, maybe you know they were picked fifth in the league, but I think all of us had a feeling that that was a team that could contend for a Big 12 championship. 
we certainly felt that way last year, and I think we feel that way again this year. I mean, you guys remember the the model that I had shared on the the Brian Fremont pod when you looked at his FEI rankings. There were only four other programs in all of college football that have ranked in the top 15 in his FEI rankings each of the last three seasons, 2021, 22, and 23, and K-State is top 15 again in his projections in 2024. The other four programs were Georgia, Alabama, Michigan, and Ohio State. K-State is loved by those models, and it shows the consistency of Chris Kleiman. They've been 27 and 13 over the last three years, though, in that time. And, you know, when you look at those advanced metrics and the models and you see them as one of those five programs, you'd like that record to be a little bit better and uh, you could hit on some of these one score games, some of those coin flip games. So hopefully they're able to do that this year or hopefully they're just able to blow everybody out. That'd be even better. Uh, So, yeah, it's an opportunity. Stan Weber shared it on the three mile pod last month, too, that Utah, Oklahoma State, K-State, those are the three programs that have a real opportunity here. Um, to become the face of the new Big 12. KU, I'm sure, is thinking the same thing as well with their uprise under Lance Leipold. So you got to make a statement here in year one of this new league. Agreed. Um, Our top storyline this week, though, is going to be how K-State will attempt to do that, and it is with Avery Johnson at quarterback. Of course, the top storyline is brought to you by our friends at Alinko. If you have any home improvement needs, Make sure you use a local company based out of Kansas City. They are K-Staters through and through, Alenco, uh, for anything home improvement related. We appreciate their support. But look, this is Saturday is really the day that K-State fans have been looking forward to for years at this point, which is, in earnest, the start of the Avery Johnson era. And I understand he played some last year. I understand he started the bowl game, and that was sort of billed as like, all right, this is the beginning. But this is really the deal, all right? This is a regular season game. It is... Him as the unquestioned starter. We've had the offseason of hype. We've had the Heisman predictions from some, like Ralph Russo of the Associated Press and the New York Post. Now Avery Johnson takes over. Johnson era begins for K-State football, and uh, I think K-State fans are incredibly, incredibly excited to see what this is going to look like. Yeah, I won't take too much time on it because I think it is, you know, after all, kind of kind of simple here. Uh, he is probably the most anticipated quarterback in school history. Uh, I don't know if there's another way around that, at least when it comes to maybe a hype preseason. I mean, I remember last year, uh, it was, I would say the first time he came out uh, onto the field at Bill Steiner Family Stadium, but it felt like it was every time. Uh, the crowd pop uh, was something that I hadn't heard in that stadium before, and I had heard you know, a Big 12 champion team uh, be received at the stadium and all this stuff. Uh, but it did not compare to what it sounded like when Avery Johnson came onto the field. So much so that I think they start stopped saying his name, him and Will Howard's name, because I think that they didn't want that to become a distraction. So that just, I think that embodies and signifies what Avery Johnson means to this fan base. And what I will say is, I think that would be a lot to shoulder and a lot of pressure to absorb for a normal kid. And it would be overwhelming, but... He is built differently and someone that embraces and carries that well. Um, it might look like pressure from the outside, but to him it's not. This is what he's kind of wanted his whole life. The only comparisons I can come up with, and John, you can weigh in here, is Michael Bishop heading into 1998 and the expectations were out on his shoulders, though we had seen it more with him in 1997. You had the L. Roberson hype. I remember people talking about L. Roberson when he was coming in as a a young player before he'd really done anything. There was a lot of hype there. And then Colin Klein, obviously, after his good 2011 season going into 2012. But Avery's just a different type of athlete and different type of quarterback with that dynamic of his explosiveness and the tools, the physical tools and makeup. The only ones you could really compare him to were probably L. Roberson and Michael Bishop in terms of the complete tool set of what he brings to the table from a dual threat capacity. And so, Look, there are a lot of high expectations for him. Normally, I would be nervous for a guy that's a true sophomore with that set of expectations placed upon his shoulders, but I'm not with Avery Johnson. I think he's ready to go. I think we saw enough glimpses last year and what we've heard from the coaching staff and the players. He's become a true leader already at a young age, and he does not seem to be you know, mystified by the moment or intimidated by the big moment. He, he takes it and uh, exceeds the pressure that's put on him. So I'm excited for it. You saw Chris Kleiman at the press conference this week just – you know, kind of dismiss a question about like, what do you do to get Avery Johnson ready? You can tell like they, they think the world of Avery Johnson. And you think about it like this, guys, and we've talked about it before. 
the, the quarterback that K-State essentially nudged out is the starting quarterback for a preseason national championship contender at Ohio State because that's how good they think Avery Johnson can be. In, I mean, in terms of the yeah, in terms of the hype and the anticipation, I would say what I think puts Avery over the top of those other guys is the fact that he's also from Kansas. It helps. I mean, yeah, I don't yeah. ninety eight was everybody you know, Michael Bishop was Big Twelve newcomer of the year in ninety seven. They knew about the entire team coming back. Like ninety eight's hard to top, I think, for anticipation, but I think Cole nailed the three. Like L. Roberson had L. Roberson is the guy who could match Avery Johnson's hype from a recruiting standpoint and not that you know recruiting rankings were a little different it wasn't as all over the place then as it is now but like people were really excited about him when he came in and thought like all right this is the next Michael Bishop it was right after Bishop then he struggled though so you know it's like yes there was a lot of hype going into 2003 but he went through a lot of struggles in between there when he came into the program to where he got to now Avery has been you know prodigious talent that's a huge recruiting get, has all the recruiting hype of like a Josh Freeman, you know, in case they landed him. He came in and played pretty well last year and now gets to take over. So there's been nothing to stop the hype where it was blunted a little bit for uh, for L. Roberson. So I it it's it's different. I would I would agree that it is different. And I just love the way that Chris Kleiman did answer that question to your point, Cole, of like he was kind of like, guys, like, look, I know K State fans, I know that sometimes with things like this, you can get a little superstitious or worried about you know expectations lofty expectations and a guy living up to it and all that but like Avery Johnson doesn't care about that like yeah he may have been a guy who liked K-State and was a K-State fan but he's not he's not tied to all this stuff like the fans are he doesn't have the trauma that the fans do with some of the stuff in the past like he's just gonna go out there and play like he's gonna go out there and make plays like we don't need to do anything to to worry about that so uh you don't need to worry about anything if you use our friends at Alenco, uh, local company, as I said, based out of Kansas City, owned by K-Staters, locally owned since 1986, in fact. And that's in an industry where uh, most have been bought out by national companies. So if you need new windows or a bathroom remodel, they have premium window replacements and Kohler Luxstone shower systems. They can also do new siding on your home, and you don't have to be in Kansas City or Manhattan. They're in western Missouri, northeast Kansas, the entire KC metro if you want to enlist their services, just go to alencohome.com. That's A L E N C O home.com. A L E N C O home.com to check out their services, including free estimates. You can call Sam at 913 961 2165 to get that free estimate. So support some great K Staters who support us here on the show. All right. Uh, Avery Johnson era in full force. We'll see how things work with Connor Riley and Matt Wells. One of the other things I'll be very interested to see here. And actually, I know this has been discussed a bit, but I'll I'll kick this around to you guys, because another thing that I pulled from Stan last night that was interesting was listening to him talk about the helmet communication stuff with Avery and like trying to figure out a rhythm of like what he wants, whether it's, hey, here's some cues for the upcoming play or just give me the play and get out of the way. And that one of the things that K-State learned from talking to NFL coaching staffs about how to use the helmet communication, which is new this year, is that every quarterback is different and you've got to figure that out. So, you know, I do think that's we're going to be watching Avery for a number of reasons and a number of things. But that is one of those kind of like inside the game things. It'll be really interesting to see how it goes in, in week one is working out the kinks of, of the new helmet communication. Yeah, and, and it's something that I've heard is to not say too much as well because then you can kind of walk into what they you know coaches in that world called paralysis by analysis where you got the kid thinking a little too much and then he doesn't react or, or play fast what what i'm curious is how much they're going to use that for actual play calling actually any most teams in college football because if you don't huddle then that really doesn't matter like it because you still would need signals to get the play to the rest of the other players so i like i so i i don't think it'll be used as much from a play calling angle as most do just because a lot of college football teams don't huddle really in light of the connor stallions thing you think they would because you can you can just give avery the play call and then he can go tell it to everybody i mean i guess yeah you're not huddling you get, slow, you're not then you, well then you slow yourself down and college football teams like to go fast i mean even yeah. even kansas state didn't huddle the last two years 
Isn't there isn't there more of a benefit, guys, of going hurry up, no huddle to get to the line of scrimmage so then that you've got your guy up in the booth like Connor Riley communicating down what he sees in the defense from up high and, you know, all right, they're in a cover two or they're in zone, they're in man, motion this guy, you know, stuff like that. Like it feels like they're being incentive to get lined up because the communication system turns off with 15 seconds left on the play clock. And so you've got a 40-second play clock. That means you have 25 seconds to communicate the play and get lined up and then maybe utilize a few seconds to see how the defense is lined up and either quick snap it because you like the look or maybe you audible really quick uh, based off the look. I mean, that that seems like something that I would think would be an incentive to get lined up quicker, though I think in week one, I believe possessions were down significantly in college football and the minimal number of games that we had largely because teams were waiting until closer to that 15 second mark to snap the football for that reason. Cause you've got 25 seconds to communicate to your quarterback. I don't know what you think about that guys. Well, first of all, Cole, how dare you disrespect week zero? Okay. Well, uh, there were five games. I watched most of them. I mean, you know, I mean, I did too from a, from a hotel room. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the other thing I wonder about is like, well, I, I just, I feel like there's going to be, a lot of kinks to be worked out because like what if you're if you are trying to pull something off like that like okay let's get lined up and then let's see what it is and then change the play or wait and to deliver the play what happens if you know so the first time someone's a little bit slow and you get halfway through the play call at 15 seconds and it just cuts off and then you know our team's gonna have to be using timeouts because you didn't get the the entire play call i mean i just think there's there's a lot that will be really fascinating to see how how it unfolds yeah, do you have a backup signal system then in that situation where somebody's got to quickly hurry in a signal? Do you have an emergency signal guy, guy going on the sideline in the event of that? You also have to factor in technology issues, right? I mean, that that happens even at the NFL, I believe. You know, you've got the headsets that go out and the other sideline has to turn theirs off as well. So, you know, you got to be, be prepared for the worst case scenarios. And Al Serby, the, the head equipment manager, he talked about that when we had him on the pod back in June or July. Uh, his team is responsible for getting the helmets ready and getting all that technology equipped and good to go before the game. And, you know, on the defensive side as well, making sure the the right guy has the helmet because it's different on defense versus offense. On offense, your quarterback's always going to have that green dot communication system. On defense, you rotate guys more. So are you swapping helmets in and out um, for that middle linebacker, whoever is the guy communicating as the uh, the head voice for the defense. Lots to think about. Lots to think about for sure uh, going into the season opener. But you don't need to think about anything other than going to homefieldapparel.com. If you want the best K-State gear around to wear to Bill Snyder Family Stadium on Saturday, depending on when you're listening to this, you could probably get, I would imagine, some expedited shipping to still get it there so you can look good at Bill Snyder Family Stadium on Saturday for the game. If not, just make sure that you have it for uh, Arizona in a couple of weeks. But they have 50-plus K-State designs. There are 100-plus schools on there if you want to venture out. Do we have Oklahoma State today? Is this finally Oklahoma State? Is it still Bucknell? What's uh... Oh, the U. Okay, so picking the U over uh, Florida in Gainesville this weekend, I imagine, then. Uh, Now now you're thinking. Okay. Okay. Is that a yes? Are you going to give us a prediction on that game? Are you picking Miami? Well, we, we, got, we got picks later, right? Okay. So, okay. Uh, okay. Yes. My my fault. My apologies. Yeah. Fair enough. All right. Well, DY's got his shirt. Uh, if you're all about the U, too, uh, you can get that at, at homefieldapparel.com. You can even get 15% off your first order using promo code 3 ma 24 Promo code 3 ma 24 for 15% off your first order at homefieldapparel.com. We're back in just a moment. We appreciate you supporting KC Sports Network by listening to our podcast. You have helped us become the highest ranked Chiefs podcast network in 2022 and 2023. And don't forget about our daily Substack newsletter, the best written analysis you can find on the Chiefs straight to your inbox every day. KCSN.substack.com Hey, if you got your own predictions that uh, you want to throw out there on the show, or you think something we said is stupid, or you think we are the best... There's a way to get in touch with us, people. It's the KCSN hotline powered by Mint Mobile, 913-407-6524, 913-407-6524. Just text that, whatever the message is that you want to deliver to us, and uh, we will we will talk about it. Um, I don't believe that we have anything, do we, unless I'm missing anything? We got nothing out there, nobody from the, the Discord bringing it, nothing, calm, no calm, no sleepy calm, hitting us up on the, the Mint Mobile Text line? No. Okay. We didn't get anything. 
It's disappointing, you guys. It's disappointing, you guys. We like to hear from you. But hey, if you do want to communicate with us on a regular basis, patreon.com slash three ma, you can join our Patreon and then join the Discord and uh, be involved in all of that discussion there. We've got one more headline here, and that is that this is a game. I, I heard a question asked at the press conference about this, and it's it's always it's a really tough. I, I think it was Tim Fitzgerald, and I was like, he actually he did a pretty good job, like trying to ask this question in a way that makes Chris Kleiman be able to answer it. But it's one of the few games this year on paper where you look at it and say, all right, uh, this is a game where you'd have a chance to get second and third stringers in, develop some depth. We know how much Bill Snyder used to value that. I mean, that's a big part of why he scheduled the way that he did. Um, who do we think needs the work the most? If uh, Assuming that K-State is going to take care of business, and we'll hear more about UT Martin in a moment from Cole, but assuming K-State takes care of business, what position group on the team? Is it you know, trying to develop the 8th and ninth offensive linemen? Is it getting the backup quarterback some work? Uh, all the defensive ends that you're trying to figure out? Like, D.Y., what do you think is most important here to get uh, second or third stringers in? Uh, defensively, probably just the D.N., right? Because I think you want to cycle through all those, what, six or seven guys you want to play. Offensively, you could kind of go across the board just because of all the first-year contributors. You want them to get probably as many snaps as possible. You want the offensive line to gel, get them going with one another a lot, bring in Andrew Lang game because he's probably going to be a key figure at some point this season. Garrett Oakley, he's only got one start under his belt. Jace Brown's only got four or five. Keegan Johnson didn't play a lot last year, at least not at high level. Dante Cephas still needs to get acclimated to the offense, at least at game speed. Dylan Edwards, same thing. Avery Johnson, one career start. So I think, you know, this is kind of a boring answer, and I don't really drill down on one thing, but I think the offense really needs to, uh, not necessarily second and third stringers, needs the guys that are going to play this year get a good amount of snaps. Well, yeah, that's a tendency I have with the offensive line because I think it would be great to rotate guys in, and I think they will do that. But you also, with this group, probably need to build some continuity and gel them together as the starting five. And, you know, I think offensive line is probably a position group. They need to play together more for that cohesion factor and communication element. And so I'd like to see them get a good good amount of snaps together as the starting five, though recognizing Andrew Langang is a guy that is going to play a significant amount of snaps too. And you want to see John Pastore get some snaps at left tackle or right tackle, wherever that might be as well. They need to develop depth. Chris Kleiman made it sound like they're comfortable with seven to eight guys, as you guys outline. Can they find that ninth guy on the offensive line? So who will that be? Um, we'll see. I, I certainly going to be curious to watch what they do up front with that group. That's going to be a position group that I have my eye on probably the most on Saturday against UT Martin. And then, yeah, they've got a lot of other guys. they got a lot of depth on defense, guys. I mean, a lot of redshirt freshmen that we've talked about at D end, at corner, and the secondary. How much can those guys get some snaps because things crank up in week two with Tulane? Like you mentioned, John, we don't have, you know, the normal run-up time. There's not that second, maybe lower FBS, lower tier FBS opponent on the schedule. Tulane is better than that. John Summerall is a good coach. Um, that's a game you got to take seriously, especially on the road. Yeah, I was gonna, the, going on the road to play Tulane, it's the same coach, right, that you had in week two last year, but it's a lot different than hosting Troy. Uh, now, by the same token, K-State did have three games in conference play last year that turned into laughers where, you know, you could utilize a little bit more depth. I think we look at the back half of K-State's schedule as an opportunity to uh, to maybe do that, but it's not going to help you really for developing guys for uh, the meat of the season. So it is important. It is definitely important. Uh, Cole, I know you talked to uh, Keegan Johnson earlier this week, which is in the uh, the podcast feed for everybody to uh, to enjoy, as those have now been broken out. But uh, anything you want to tell the people who have not listened to uh, to Keegan Johnson? Did you did you give him the over under? Did you ask him like over under? I've got you breaking Tyler Lockett's receiving records at K State. Um, are you going to? Was that uh, number one? First of all, folks, I if, if you haven't heard the over under pods, I did not have him breaking Tyler Lockett's receiving record. Just for clarity, uh, I had the over under set at 700 yards for Keegan, and I did have him going over that. And by the way, Dy has him going over that too. Dy, you can uh, you flipped on that. You you got him over 700, right? Yeah, yeah. See, John, Dy's on board. Now's your chance. You wanna you wanna make a change? I'm gonna need to see. Let me let me at least watch a game. Let me at least watch okay. a game. Yeah, all right, fair, fair enough. 
Uh, yeah, so it was the first show of our Wildcat Weekly Player Spotlight brought to you by Riverbank Brewing and Council Grove in conjunction with Wildcat NIL. We'll be doing those weekly. We'll break them out as separate shows each week during the season, so they won't be put within this pregame show and packaged in here. So be on the lookout for that each week. It was about a 25-minute interview with Keegan, who was really open, uh, talked about his experiences, upbringing. Uh, you know, for folks that don't know, obviously he's from Nebraska. He grew up a Nebraska fan. Uh, his dad was a kind of a Nebraska legend, was a Nebraska Gatorade Player of the Year, played as a wingback at Nebraska on the national championship teams in 94 and 95. And he's got two older brothers, Keegan does, that one had uh, over 1,300 yards a year at South Dakota State, was a two-time FCS All-American. Uh, the other, and, and that was that was Cade Johnson, by the way. He went on, he's with the Seattle Seahawks currently. And then CJ played with Josh Allen at Wyoming, had success there. So two All-State wide receivers that were ahead of him in his family lineage. And so there's a lot of pressure on Keegan. Keegan's always been uh, heralded and regarded as the more talented of the three. And so he played at the same high school as his dad and his brothers. And that's, that's pretty rare for a guy to stay in the same community all those years. So you can imagine the pressure on his shoulders growing up that have followed him everywhere. He was a coveted recruit, both out of high school and then also in the transfer portal chose K state over Notre Dame. So I encourage everyone to check it out, get to know Keegan a little bit better. He's battled through some injuries. We talk about that, the toll that's had on him. Uh, The K-State offense looking ahead to this year, his relationship with Connor Riley, which dates back almost a decade because Connor Riley recruited his brothers as well. So there's a real familiarity with those two. And um, just dive into all things about Keegan Johnson. He was really, really open, talkative, and it was a great discussion. So, So go check it out. Love that. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. The family background, you know, I mean, I know a lot of times you just see the guy out there playing. You don't understand or take the time to get to know the story. That's that's good info. Good info. Uh, Cole, I know you guys like never really look at my outlines. I did send it last night. Did you did you actually look at my outline for this next part? Yes, sir. I looked at it. I looked at the outline right when you said you sent it. In fact, I was I was doing research on South Dakota State last night in preparation of the outline that you sent, John. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, well, we'll have a little South Dakota State mention coming up. I just wondered if you saw what I said about UC Martin. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I give myself little clues, like little, you know, here's like one line about where I want to go with this part of it. Did you see what I said about UT Martin? I saw the disrespect you put on their name. Yeah. And I won't tell, I won't tolerate that. This, this show is about, we respect every opponent that comes into Manhattan, Kansas or any opponent that we play on the schedule road or away. So yeah, I mean, I, John, I, just, I, I, I do not respect UT Martin. I do not respect UT Martin. I'm here to say it right now. I do not respect UT Martin. Well, DY didn't retra- respect Troy last year in case they beat him 42 to 13 while I was pushing back on him. So, uh, I guess, I guess if you don't respect him, that's, that's okay. So John DY, do you respect UT Martin? No. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Well, uh, K-State uh, under Chris Kleiman against four FCS opponents is uh, won by an average margin of victory of 40 to 9 in those games. And uh, that's only because of the 31 23 game to Southern Illinois that we talked about previously. Otherwise, the number would be far greater. Look, UT Martin 15 and 2 in their league over the last three years. They've won either a share or outright conference championship all three seasons. Uh, they're projected to win the league. Again, this year, it's the Ohio Valley Conference Big South merger. It's the second year of that. They're picked to win that league. SEMO last year was picked to win the league in case they trounce them 45 to nothing. This year, UT Martin picked to win the league. Look, it's an experienced football team. Jason Simpson's a very respected coach there. He's a legend at UT Martin. He's going into his 19th season. Has really transformed the program. And they feel like they've maybe got more depth coming into this year than they've had at any point during Simpson's career. They've got a lot of experience. They returned 14 starters from a team that was one of the only FCS teams to rank in the top 30 in both team offense and team defense last year. They also added 19 transfers, 17 coming from the FBS. Um, you know, they're trying to get ready to make it to the FCS playoffs. They haven't made the FCS playoffs since 2021. That's a bitter feeling for that program because they lost on a coin flip in 2022 to get into the FC playoffs due to tiebreakers, and they had to flip a coin. They lost. They called tails. They lost that coin flip. And then in 2023, they felt like they should have gotten that large berth, and they were not successful in doing so. So they're pretty bitter. They're a hungry program that's uh, coming into Manhattan. And uh, as we think about the offense, guys, 
they led the conference last year in scoring offense, nearly 32 points per game and nearly 440 yards per game. They were turned eight starters on the offensive side of the ball, uh, multiple wide receivers. They've got some talent there. Kincaid Dent is their quarterback, six foot five, 235 pounder. He's a big kid. And he spent his first four seasons at Ole Miss. He transferred from Ole Miss uh, last season. Last year was his first starter as a UT Martin quarterback. He threw for uh, 2,295 yards, nearly 2,300 yards, 25 touchdowns to eight interceptions, but only a completion rate of 54%. So that's pretty low. He's a dual threat kid, though. For the size and stature, you wouldn't think he could move all that well. He had 63 carries for 434 yards last year, nearly seven yards a carry. Now he had 83 yards lost on sacks. So that comes down to 351 yards rushing and 5.6 yards per carry when you account for sacks. But a good player with good wide receivers. All-conference receiver DeMonte Tanksley, nearly 700 yards receiving last year. Tremonte Tucker, a physical wide receiver with nearly 500 yards, a guy they really like. But where they, they struggle a little bit, or the question mark may be at running back, guys, they lost their All-American running back, Sam Franklin, who ran for nearly 1,400 yards and 11 touchdowns last year, averaged 6.2 yards per rush number four in the FCS in rushing. He transferred to Oklahoma. He will be on the Sooners roster this upcoming season in the SEC. In fact, he was the first player to land at Oklahoma out of the transfer portal. They've got a guy, Narco LaFleur, coming in at running back, a guy who averaged five and a half yards per carry last year for the program. And then they've got a really good interior of their offensive line, a very respected group with over 2,400 career snaps, led by Drake Carroll, Vance Van Every at the guard position. So there are three returning guys on the interior at center and at guard have uh, combined nearly 2,400 snaps in their career. They only allowed 12 sacks last season, 1.09 per game. That ranked 12th in the FCS. They were seventh in the country at 440 yards per game on offense and uh, eighth most rushing yards in the FCS, top 10 also in yards per carry at 5.6. There's your uh, your UT Martin offensive rundown, guys. Still, still, uh, still don't respect them. If you don't have a Dakota in your name as an FCS school, I probably don't respect you. Huh. UT Martin, more like UT aren't gonna win on Saturday. Oh my god! Wow. Yeah, that 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 was that was rough. Did you, did you pick that one liner up while you were walking around on the Harvard campus in Boston this week, John? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, no, just. Did it myself. Did it myself right here while I was listening to you do that preview. All right. Well, uh, UT Martin defense, uh, they led by an All-American at corner, O'Shea Baker, who they've actually talked about. Jason Simpson, their head coach, talked about playing him both ways and playing him a wide receiver as well. First team all-conference last year had 49 pass breakups throughout his career. Excuse me, 32 passes defended in his career, 26 pass breakups and six interceptions. 49 tackles, six and a half tackles for loss last year. Um, I already mentioned all conference. They lost quite a bit on the defensive line. Uh, starters combined for 40 tackles for loss last season are gone. Uh, they've added quite a bit from the portal. They feel really good about what they got at linebacker. Several guys back there. They don't turn you over much. In fact, they were 106 in the country in turnover margin in 2023. Only turned their opponents over 12 times. Tied for sixth in the country in tackles for loss last year at seven and a half per game. Seventh in the country at just under three yards per rush allowed, guys. So that's something to monitor. Now, they lost a decent amount up front. So we'll see how their run defense looks this year. And um, tied for 27th, just under two and a half sacks per game last year. Number 24 in the FCS at just under five yards per defensive play allowed. I'll go one thing farther on you. 109th out of 122 FCS teams at just under 23 yards per kick return allowed. They allowed a punt return touchdown. K-State will have a special teams touchdown in this game mm, wow okay didn't have one the entire year last year which is the first time since uh, 2004 that they didn't ever return touchdown that's correct yeah. yeah and john you'd like this i guess for your disrespect in their last five games against power conference teams which made back to 2018 ut martin's been outscored 259 to 52 an average margin of defeat of 52 to 10 yeah ut martin more like ut farton oh my god the answer are so immature See, I actually thought about that one, and I decided, man, a little too low-hanging fruit. Let me try to be a little more clever with it. That's what I was, when I was talking about the offense, that's what I was doing. So I passed on it, but D.Y. took it, and that's fine. You know, I think it's good that we got both of those out there. Okay, well, um, I'm sure all the 7- to 10-year-old community that listen to 3 Mall will have a good laugh in their car after your guys' little jokes. So, uh, you know, the children will love it. Brody will love your jokes, guys. 
So send this to all the UT Martin fans that you guys know out there. Make sure yeah. make sure they know that there's zero respect here on the the Three Mom podcast. I hope everybody respects quick hitters because I mean I think it's the best part of of every single show. I am a little disappointed Cole actually looked at it though to be prepared. I think it's it's probably uh it's probably better unprepared. Anyway, um more official carries, okay? Who will have more carries on Saturday? Like showing up at the box score as carries, uh Avery Johnson or Dylan Edwards, DY. Avery Johnson or Dylan Edwards. Dylan Edwards probably don't want to shoot out the Avery Johnson carries against a team like UT Martin and you know, temp fate, right? So I'll say Edwards. Yeah, I'll take Dylan Edwards as well for a couple of reasons. One, DY outline. Secondly, I expect them to minimize the carries on DJ Giddens, especially in the first game, given that he's coming off injury in the spring and upper body injury. So I would expect that, you know, DJ Giddens probably isn't going to get quite as many touches as he will in most games this season. So Dylan Edwards will probably get a few more via the running game. Part of the reason I made sure to specify like official carries, I mean, like, one, like, obviously, I don't think they're going to call a bunch of designed runs for Avery, but, yeah. you know, take it off and scrambling will still count. Stacks would still count. They're breaking in a new offensive line. Um, but then beyond that, too, Dylan Edwards, we, we kept seeing, like, the little fly sweep thing where they just pitch it forward to him. That's going to count as a pass, right? Like, that's not a carry. Correct. So, you know, keep that in mind. I, I would I would lean Dylan Edwards, but I think, I think that winds up being close. I think that winds up being close. Um, all right, what's the higher number? Keegan Johnson receiving yards or Dylan Edwards rushing yards? We'll put, uh, again, remembering that fly sweep thing may not actually be rushing yards for one Dylan Edwards. I will say Keegan Johnson receiving yards because I think he can get 75 plus and I think Edwards gets a little bit of everything uh, through the year on the ground. Oh, we know when John's taken with this one. I will, uh, I'll take... Look, this hurts me to say because I just got my guy Keegan on the show. I still think wow. Keegan's. I, no, no, don't go there. Don't you dare. Okay, oh, let wow. me let me let me finish. Keegan Johnson, he's in here, and Cole is flip flopping like a politician. That Keegan Johnson will have north of seventy yards receiving in this game, so he will still be effective. But Dylan Edwards is going to bust in house one. That's probably going to be fifty plus yards. K State had three plays last year of fifty yards or more. Dylan Edwards will have one in this game. And as a result, because of that explosive playmaking ability, I'm going to say Dylan Edwards is probably closer to 100 yards, and I'll take him to be slightly over Keegan Johnson, who I have over 70. Yeah, to me, the the answer is Dylan Edwards, because I think he will I think he will pop a big one. But the, the tough part is, like, does that come on a, a – is it going to be him in the passing game, or is it going to be him running the ball? But I'll go Dylan Edwards there. Uh, we've got a couple, speaking of the Dakota FCS schools, of tough tests for Big 12 teams, and the lines are very similar here. So Colorado is a 10-point home favorite against North Dakota State coming up on Thursday. Oklahoma State is a 9.5-point favorite against defending FCS national champion South Dakota State. So what's the more likely scenario here? North Dakota State beats Colorado or South Dakota State covers at Oklahoma State? And I made sure to specify it that way because I think if I said, you know, what's the more likely scenario, one of these teams wins, everybody's going to say Colorado loses, even though South Dakota State is actually the better of the two teams right now. But D.Y., what is more likely, NDSU beats Colorado or South Dakota State merely covers at Oklahoma State? It's definitely South Dakota State covering against Oklahoma State. I think it's more likely South Dakota State wins than North Dakota State wins. Wow. So you could have said like that way, and I still would have took South Dakota State. It's a different era of FCS football. South Dakota State is that much better than North Dakota State at the moment. Um, I think there's a pretty sizable gap between those two. And Oklahoma State, kind of look back over time, a team that will typically get out of the blocks pretty slow. So South Dakota State, I think, actually can win this game and, and might win this game, even though I have Oklahoma State winning the Big 12. You know, I guys, I love Mike Gundy. I love that OSU program. And I'm concerned they're going to embarrass the Big 12 this weekend. I mean, I'm real concerned they might lose this game. You know, they already embarrassed us last year with the 33-7 to loss in Stillwater to South Alabama. That was that was a tough one to take. South Dakota State's won 29 straight games. They outscored their opponents 146-15 to in the four-game playoff run last year. They beat North Dakota State four consecutive games dating back to 2021. 
Uh, North Dakota State's not quite the program that they once were. Tim Polisek comes in as the head coach after Ants leaves to become a position coach at USC. So you got a coaching change at North Dakota State. I actually really like Colorado to cover against North Dakota State, even though I've been making fun of Colorado as well. I, th- I, I just think they're going to out-talent North Dakota State, and uh, I think South Dakota State is going to cover that number. And they got, look, South Dakota State has arguably the best quarterback in the FCS and Mark Gronkowski coming back. So they lost a lot on defense. The defense had allowed nine points per game, number one in the FCS. But I still think they're going to put up a test for Ollie Gordon in that uh, that Oklahoma State offense. I can't wait to watch this game. How dare you? How dare both of you? Oklahoma State is going to be fine. They will be okay. At this time last year, they didn't have their quarterback situation figured out. Remember, they were playing three quarterbacks when the South Alabama game happened. They were playing three. If you got two quarterbacks, you got none. You got three quarterbacks. I think you've got about negative five. Okay, so that's that's not a good thing. Ollie Gordon was not even the starting running back. They hadn't established that. Totally different team. All right. They're locked in. They're ready to go. This is Colorado. Do Colorado's a mess right now. Is Prime going to take any questions after he loses on Thursday? Like, will he take questions from anybody? It's North Dakota State beating Colorado. South, by the way, South Dakota State, I think, is better than the South Alabama team that that beat Oklahoma State. So, well, yeah, I mean, I, I think very much so. Yeah. Um, big non-con game on Saturday that I'm looking forward to. It's I, to me the biggest non-conference opportunity easily that the Big Twelve as a league has this year which is going to be important when you're talking about trying to fight for respect. It's West Virginia, Penn State, big noon kickoff. The only other game that rivals this a little bit, I think, from a non-conference standpoint for the Big 12 is when UCF goes to Florida. Now, that's later into the season. But what's the more likely Big 12 non-con upset over a Power 2 school, UCF at Florida or uh, West Virginia beating Penn State? UCF over Florida, and it's not close. I think UCF is better than West Virginia this year, and – People aren't going to like to hear this, but I think Penn State's going to be pretty good. I think bringing in Andy Kotelnicki, an offensive coordinator, is going to change the outlook for the program. And I've already been called a a doofus for this. I think Penn State can win the Big Ten because I don't trust the quarterback situation at Ohio State. I don't like picking a first-year head coach to win a league, and I don't like picking a new team to win the league. By process of elimination, that really opens it up, in my opinion, for Penn State, and I love the Kotelnicki hire. You know, look, I was initially probably going to go with West Virginia on this. West Virginia has been a team that I I like the uh, the line in this game, which by the way has moved from around ten and a half to around eight and a half uh, as West Virginia's underdogs. So people are getting on the Mountaineers um, to cover the spread. I think it's going to be a great game. I'm going to take though UCF largely because first of all, UCF marching into Florida, I think they're going to have the desire to want that game, it's going to mean a heck of a lot to them. Not that it won't mean a lot to West Virginia to potentially knock off Penn State at home in the season opener, but I feel like UCF's going to have that underdog mentality going into that game. Gus Malzahn's coached in the SEC. He's coached against Florida, and K.J. Jefferson, a quarterback, has gone on the road to places like that and been good. UCF, I think, is a dark horse team in this Big 12 title race. I expect UCF to finish 6-3 and or better in the Big 12 race, so... I'll take UCF at Florida also because Billy Napier has been a mess there. Yeah, I mean, look, D.Y., it's consistent for for D.Y. if he's going to pick Miami, which I would assume to uh, to beat Florida. I mean, Billy Napier is going to be scuffling out of the out of the blocks and they've got a ridiculous schedule this year. So they they really need that UCF game. And that's one they really can't afford to lose. I've already gone on record and saying I'm, I'm picking West Virginia to win. Okay. I'm picking West Virginia to win. I'm I'm buying into some of the hype there. I know DY has not been very high on the Mountaineers. I just do. Drew Aller sucks. I, Andy Kotelnik, he's a star. I think he's really good. I'm not buying Drew Aller yet. I think the Big 12 could win both of these games. I'm going to be Big 12 homer guy here, but I'll slightly into uh, to West Virginia just because they're at home. It's going to be a crazy environment. And when UCF goes to Florida, Florida is going to be like just desperately needing wins. That's one that they can't afford to lose. And it's on the road. At the swap, I think that'll be. Tough. I would. I would not be stunned if Drew Aller looks good this year under Ina Kotelnicki. Would not be stunned. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Okay. Well, you brought up Ohio State's quarterback situation. Dy, how about this one? Who starts more games this year, Will Howard or Jalen Daniels? Will Howard, you got the concerns <laughs> about is he going to lose his job? Jalen Daniels, you got the concerns like about targeting the re- Will Howard or Jimmy? Like he targets <laughs> that is really targeted at you. Who's starting more games? Yeah, because it's like 
<laughs> here's the Buckeye guy and the the Will Howard situation, and all, also everyone in the KU world already hates your guts. So here's a lose lose situation for you, buddy. <laughs> How about it? Uh, I will take Jalen Daniels. I'm not really going to wow. get to the like the wow. details, but like, I, and I know it's like taking a flyer here, but like I say this about Keegan Johnson. I say this about other some players from Kansas State that have been kind of injury prone that they're due for a good health year and like Jalen Daniels being ready for game one maybe he's due for a good health year I, I I would roll the dice on on that being more likely I think Kansas fans listen DY is a friend he's an ally please take note he's not an enemy um I'll, I'll take Will Howard I'll be the enemy only because I'm just going to base it off past history, and we just haven't seen it from Jalen Daniels the last couple of years for health. I hope he is healthy. I, I think it'd be great if KU comes to Manhattan at full strength and has Jalen Daniels at quarterback on October 26. So I hope he stays healthy and has a good season for KU. But I, Will Howard's got so much talent around him, as you've outlined before, D.Y. at Ohio State, that as long as he can just be a little above average and get the ball to the playmakers, I think he'll he'll retain the job. So I'll take uh, I'll take Ohio State and Will Howard. Uh, I'm going to lean Will mm-hmm. over here. I, I, I'm I'm with Cole. Like I think I think Jalen Daniels is, is going to play most of the season. But even I mean, you look two years ago, like he played nine games, right? So it wasn't you know he battled an injury but was able to come back. I, I don't. It just yeah. If you're playing the odds in the history, it's unlikely that he's going to play the entire season. I don't think it's going to be last year, like three games and out. And Will. We, when at 2022 K State, when he had more weapons around him and things were a little bit more established, he was he was pretty good. Now pressure is different at Ohio State, but it's also like most of their schedule is not difficult, and he's got an insane roster. Most of their schedule is not difficult at all. He may struggle against Michigan, but if that's going to be at the end of the year when he already has all these starts under his belt. So I I would lean Will Howard on that one. Um, that was a fun yeah, one. I, I I saved the best for last on that one just for you, Dy. With the only ranked teams they play, but Oregon, Michigan, and then Iowa, I think. I don't think that's kind of why I like Penn State. I don't have to play Ohio State. Yeah. Well, all right. Let's take a second and all celebrate me for winning the lead pipe lock of the week uh, last year. I was six and five. Cole was five and six. DY four and seven. So, uh, you know, take a bow here. Uh, if you're trying to make money, I would listen to uh, my lead pipe lock of the week, which is going to be. Uh, I guess I could have made it West Virginia since I picked them to win. I decided to uh, be creative, go outside of that, but that's I'll, I'll give you two then. There's two for the price of one. Uh, Stanford sucks. I think Stanford's awful. Uh, TCU is on the road at Stanford on Friday, actually. Uh, TCU is a nine-and-a-half point favorite. I'm not sky high on TCU, but I, will, I, I do think that they will be better this year. And, Cole, you know this. You went to Stanford with me in 2016. No, I didn't. I didn't go. <laughs> you didn't go? No. You guys patched like me in on power. No, I didn't. Okay. You guys patched me in on Power Cat Game Day, and you were like, "Oh, it's such beautiful weather out here." While I was sitting in, was that really just being Stanton? I was like, I vividly remember Stanton being there. Yeah, I know Stanton, Stanton was there. Stanton, Stanton was there. I was not. But John, thanks for. Didn't you do, you're not learning, John. Didn't you do this last year with TCU? No, two years ago. He did it. No, Colorado. I thought you did it like Colorado. Colorado. Yeah, I think he did took I, TCU to go. Yeah. I, no, two years ago I did it with Jeez. TCU at Colorado. Yeah, it wasn't last year. It was it wasn't last year. It was two years ago with TCU at Colorado. But yes, I'm doing it again. TCU is going to win by like three touchdowns at Stanford. Stanford's awful, and there's no environment. The whole setup with the Stanford thing is that there will be like five people in the stands there. They were three and nine last year. There was nobody there in 2016 when they had Christian McCaffrey, like that, and Bryce Love, like that. That is not a difficult environment to play in at all. They'll be fine. TCU will roll. John, I don't like it. I don't like it. Uh, Stanford's a team that I've seen a lot of people on in this game. So I don't like it because I think TCU's a dud. I have them like 12th or 13th in the Big 12 this year. The, the metrics love TCU, though. I will say that. Yeah, I, mean, I was going to say, they're, they're really talented. If Josh Hoover is worth anything this year, they're going to be a lot better. They they did the whole unproven transfers thing again that blew up in their face last year. I just, I don't know why to repeat a, a formula that didn't work but that, i mean then the metrics love them last year i don't know good pick john 
I, I would disagree. Thank that. you. They, Thank they, you. they did. The metrics did like TCU last year, which is partially why they're liked this year. I was trying to pull up the uh, Kelly Ford win probability for TCU in this game real quick. I'm scrolling. I'm scrolling. I'm almost there, guys. And just go on without me. I'll, I'll pull it up later and tell you after. You well, what you just tell us your pick. Um, my pick is uh, the Buffaloes. Colorado Dion, Coach Prime, Thursday what night. Was so, that, what was that hand motion that you just did? I don't know. I just it looked like the head. Baylor. I don't know. I, I meant Baylor claw. I've been having trouble straightening my hands lately, so like I can't keep my fingers straight because like you know I've been typing and texting so much that I feel like I'm developing an issue with my hands. So sorry if I had my hand curled up. This is a way to call that out, uh, you know, on something for me, John. It's a you know a, a factor I'm sensitive about, but I'll take Colorado. I, I think uh, too much talent. I think the Buffs will. Uh, I, I just don't. North Dakota State coaching change. I don't think that program's quite at the same level that they've been. So um, I think Colorado will be able to score enough on North Dakota State that they'll cover a nine and a half point spread, which is what I've got it at, by the way, guys. Nine and a half. You could have got it at like eight. Yeah, I know. That the line's moving that way because everybody's they've they've seen I I placed a bet on it and the line shifted because of you know, smart smart money. Heavy hitter. Yeah, a lot of money moving that line. You see my shirt. I got the U Miami minus now because I, I admittedly I took this a couple weeks ago, but Miami two and a half, uh, two and a half point favorite against the Gators. I look, I, I like those numbers when you got the hook where it's two and a half and you just need a field goal win. I think me Miami solid to good this year. The the one thing that could sink me is Mario Cristobal is a terrible in game coach, but I think he's got a freaking dude at quarterback in Cam Ward, and I don't really like Florida. A whole lot there. Uh, Billy Nee is building that thing, but they're going to have a rough go. Uh, but so, uh, bonus one, too, I think. I think I saw I like this. Georgia State. I know this is weird. Georgia State plus 21 and a half against Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech's coming back from Ireland mm-hmm. in a big time high after beating Florida State. So Georgia State to 21 and a half against Georgia Tech. That's that's a good one, I think. That's That's pretty smart. I like that one a lot. I wish I would have dug into it and and found that one dy that's that's pretty good i respect yeah. that yeah dy good work uh john stanford has a uh 25 chance to meet tcu per kelly ford so you're you're probably close tcu's got around a 75 percent chance to win eight or more games this year according to kelly ford so that's about where i'd have them i, I think tcu i think tcu wins seven or eight this year a game with with some relevance for kansas state what do you guys think about Notre Dame A and M this year, this week? Sorry. Well, can both teams lose? You know, um, <laughs> can that happen? I don't like. I, I don't like taking a first year head coach so so soon. But A and M's the home team, and and Notre Dame's lost a lot, and just lost a starting left tackle for the year to an injury too. So, I got. Problem is, like, obviously, I like Colin Klein. I, I like Elko. Um, I don't like Texas A&M fans, so <laughs> tough. It's a tough one for me. Uh, it was easier when Jimbo was there, just to to really outright laugh at them and make fun of them. I don't know. That's a really tough game to figure out. I would I would almost probably lean A and M. Um, I think that's going to be a really tough environment, obviously, for Notre Dame. It's essentially, point. a pick them. Yeah. Okay. Well, speaking of pick them, we do have to pick the K State game. And uh, I'm going to go last. So, D.Y., I'll have you go first here. I know you, you don't respect UT Martin at all. Uh, how little do you respect UT Martin when it comes to the final score? Uh, it, I think it looks a lot like last year um, or like every year when Kansas State meets an FCS school that is in Southern Illinois when Skylar Thompson gets hurt. So, I, I like Kansas State. Take care of business, 45-3. to 3. I'll have uh, UT Martin, 10 K State fifty two. Uh, you guys thought I was going to take UT Martin to win by naming their score first, didn't you? They were going to hold K State below ten points. So I yeah, tricked you. Yeah, I never thought yeah. that. Yeah, 50, sure 50, that. 52 to ten uh, in the preseason uh, projection show that we did. I K State fifty two to three. But the more that I dug in on UT Martin's offense, I'll show a little respect for a touchdown for them to get because like they got a decent offense. They got a veteran quarterback uh, who's going into his six year college football, and they got some talent. Chris, Chris Lyman. Chris Kleiman teams at Kansas State have shut out the FCS school three times. Just throwing it out there. Mm. Is it three or is it two? 
Well, Nichols, Nichols, Nichols scored 14. Oh, which, okay. I was thinking Nichols was. Last year there was. So Well, so Nichols it's... scored Nichols scored a garbage touchdown, garbage time touchdown with three minutes left to make it 49 to 14 as a final. But yeah, they've shut out the FCS opponents each of the last two years. So 52 to 10 is my uh, my score. I think K-State's defense really, uh, really shines and the offense has some explosives. Can't wait to see it. Uh, D.Y., I'm glad you mentioned that about the shutouts. I, you have pushed me even further to the side of disrespect. I was not going to have it as a shutout, but you make a very, very valid point. K-State, baby. K-State will win uh, 69 to nothing in week one over UT Martin. 69 to nothing cats. No respect uh, for the Warhawks, whatever they are. No respect at all. Guy on, guy. There's guy on. Yeah, we'll sky sky, whatever. 69 to zip, baby. Okay, but you have 45 to 17 on the outline. How did you flip so high? Like, that's quite a... Because I convinced them with yeah. the shutout, and that gives you us what? more possession. Do you know That's a 41-point swing. He had it at 45 to 17, and then he had it complaining? Are you complaining that John likes Kansas State? Yeah, I was, told that I, was too, I was told that I was too negative about this team. I've decided to turn over a new leaf, uh, 69 to nothing. The turn, look, Cole, how are they going to score that many points? I'm wearing like the little turnover chain thing right now. For those of you that are just listening on podcast, which will be my, you know, that's like my Corso headgear for the year. They're going to be a lot of turnovers, some pick sixes, you know, they won't, the, 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 the war Skyhawks won't be able to do anything. The, uh, I mean, uh, the last time case they beat a team that bad was, was a 76 nothing against Ball State and what? 98 99 that era that was 99 i believe 99 yeah i mean i i don't know man well you know i love it by the way john i tried to uh are you gonna wear that to the game saturday you're gonna be the house. i will be in the press box so no i will i will not be wearing it to the game you no. show up there with it i tried john to uh request the old willie the wildcat scary head that's in the alumni center and i was told it's locked away i was gonna try to make it my corso headgear pick every show the one that'll terrify children because I really want to scare my kids with it on Halloween, but K State has not lended it to me. I don't think I'm going to get my hands on it, so we'll just have to suffice with your turnover chain. Yeah, that's what we got. Hope everyone likes it. Uh, hope everyone enjoys us being back in uh, in season mode. That was, that was that was fun today. We appreciate it. Thanks to the help of all of our sponsors: uh, Holiday Distillery, Homefield Apparel, Mint Mobile with the text line, Alinko, and uh, of course Nick Springer keeping it all together behind the scenes. Uh, For Derek Young and Cole Manbeck, I'm John Kurtz. Thanks for listening to another edition of 3 Mall.